All right, I'm back here. Finally back here. It's been a while since I've made an episode of this series, and unfortunately there's a bit of a backstory behind... Oh, well, <laughs> gotta get back into town. Went the wrong direction. Okay, so I was making this series some time ago, towards the end of um, last year and into January. This is 2021, I'm recording this now. It's February 2021. Well, in early... Well, in January, I ended up, for some reason, losing my save data. Now, I wasn't that far into the game, so it wasn't a big trouble for me to just sort of start over again. But it was going to take me a little bit of time, and it ended up taking me a little bit more time than I wanted. Plus, I had other things going on, and it ended up sucking up my time. So I didn't really end up getting back to this as quickly as I'd wanted to. Then, in early February, I ended up catching COVID-19, which put a complete stop to any production of any videos that I had coming through. And I, it actually made me pretty sick for quite a while. I was sick for weeks. And not only like, well, I had a fever and all that kind of stuff, and it kind of ruined my concentration. Also, my voice was messed up, and I was coughing a lot, so I couldn't really record anything. So that ended up holding me up a little bit further. But it's um, February 26th at this point of 2021, and I'm finally getting back to producing new episodes of things. <laughs> it's been a while, and it feels weird getting back to this, but here we are. It especially feels weird getting back to a series which has been on the hiatus for as long as this has. So hopefully I don't miss a step here. I did make a mistake, though, by failing... I have this kind of unusual setup when it comes to my recording setup. For this series, I'd intended to record all of my commentary live as I play through. And it's a blind playthrough of this game, so I figure, like, well, the live commentary is probably better. Unfortunately, my recording setup is a little bit complex or more complex than normal in this case because I have, I'm using NVIDIA Broadcast with a, an external microphone and I'm feeding it into Bandicam, which is recording the audio, and sometimes audio just doesn't capture through my microphone. And I won't realize this until it's too late, and that was the case here. So I played this, and then I realized that, well, my commentary didn't make it through. I don't have any audio. Or at least none, no audio of my voice. Audio of the gameplay, of course. So at least for this episode, I'm recording the commentary post-gameplay. This is a weird town, and it's one that I know in the previous episode I actually got into and wandered around, so we're seeing a little bit of overlap, but I figure I ended that episode in a weird place, so might as well start this over with a better idea of where I'm supposed to end up going and doing and all that kind of stuff. So here we are. This is a weird town, and I have to say I don't much care for it. Because of all the stupid traps that are all over the place, there's something wrong with these people. This, <laughs> every town is going to have some kind of quirk to it. That's how you make things memorable. But this definitely feels like there's something wrong with this town. These people uh, setting up traps in the middle of their town for no reason. And we have to talk to a damn parrot to find the mayor. Because if we find the mayor, the mayor will let us through the sort of passageway up north. I looked around, oh, see I'm caught in a trap. I looked around thinking that maybe I'd be able to find a weapon shop or an item shop or something, because Ryu is still using kind of a crap weapon. It'd be nice if he could uh, get something a little bit better. Hmm. There's a graphical glitch you'll notice around the characters. You see it around Ryu's feet. It's also through like Nina's head and her shoulder. It's just sort of like this blank line. I tend to play a lot of my games on this series on emulators. And it's just easier that way. Easier to record, easier to edit, and all that kind of stuff. Unfortunately, when it comes to emulators, they tend not to emulate games perfectly. So you 
oftentimes have games where you need to adjust graphical settings and all that kind of stuff in order to make the game not show any kind of visual glitches like what we're seeing here. Unfortunately, it doesn't always work out that way. Uh, in this case, I had adjusted the graphical settings in the EPSXE emulator in order to make the game and make the emulator run Resident Evil better than it does now. Because the one thing I did over the past month video I produced was a kind of a look back on the game Resident Evil. I intended to do the in the series, or at least the mainline series. I only ended up making it through the first one, and I was sick at the time, so it didn't end up turning out all that good, and I feel a little, little ashamed of how bad it ended up being. But I'm kind of lazy, so I'm not going to fix it. But I adjusted the graphical settings to make Resident Evil work better. And it doesn't really carry over that well to Breath of Fire. Some kind of weird-ass bipedal elephant. And here we go again with these crazy bastards wandering off into the woods, setting a bunch of traps out here, too. Of course, it's less crazy that they set traps out here than they did setting a bunch of traps in the middle of their own damn town. See how that makes any damn sense. <laughs> Alright, so this is a... I have to say that this is a bit of a frustrating area, and I kind of got stuck in this area. Now look, I fell down a hole. I kind of got stuck in this area because the layout is a little bit confusing and it loops back upon itself. The traps aren't that big of a burden, but the way that the level is set out, it loops back upon itself a lot, and it's not very large, but all the different areas look the same. Now, I'm sure it's one of those things that if you really uh, played the game a lot, you would memorize your way through. It would be easy enough. And I could probably have gotten through this area inside of like two minutes if I knew what I was doing. But that brings me into the idea of something that I occasionally bring up on this channel. And that's games in the 90s, now particularly, especially adventure games and RPGs and all that kind of stuff, had this problem where... There seemed to have been a bit of a disconnect between the developers and their player base over what can be expected of the player. You would have lots of games come out where the developer, impl uh, I mean, not intentionally, but the development of the game and the levels and the puzzles and all that seemed to have been based around the idea that you should be able to read their minds. Here's the stump up here. That you should be able to sort of read developers' minds because they'll go and they'll place a puzzle in there 
or a a um, maze or something and not really be extraordinarily clear with what they want you to do or have some kind of confusing layout and it makes perfect sense to them why because they're the people that created it and there's also the um, game testers who play through it over and over again and it may confuse them a little bit the first time through but then they play through it again and it makes more sense to them and they eventually lose track of what it was that confused them to begin with and well you end up stuck with a game where an outside observer may not quite have the best understanding of how to get through something so okay you know what that was pretty common in games back then and i think it really just came down to iteration now developers it was less true at the time. This is the 90s. This game was made in the 90s, the late 90s. It was less true because game development times were shorter, but they still took a couple of years. So a developer may have been working on this area for months. So then they make their first version of it, and they're, they're playing through it, and the game testers are playing through it, and then they... They get so used to seeing it that they, like, okay, you know what? Just like with a lot of puzzles, they get so used to seeing it that they go, you know what, I need to make that a little bit more complicated, a little bit harder. So then they change something, and the solution is already in their head, so it makes perfect sense to them. And the one that I'm always going to run back to, the perfect example of this, would be the game Silent Hill 2. Now, there is a stupid little puzzle in there where you have a trash chute where something is jammed in it and then it's like a key or something like that and the solution to this is to take a six pack can of juice and throw it into the trash chute in order to dislodge what's in there now in real life of course that's something you could do but in games very infrequently are you able to actually do something that's realistic. So how am I supposed to just intuit that that's something I'm supposed to do? It made perfect sense to the developer. The developer implemented it. They have access to their own thought process at the time, and it makes perfect sense to them. Me, on the outside, I had to run around like an idiot for half an hour before I just stumbled upon that solution. And in this case, you could see I'm wandering around inside of this stupid-ass wooded area looking for the way out. Hey, a pointed stick. That's a useless weapon. Moving on. I didn't play a whole lot of Breath of Fire 1, but Breath of Fire 2 and 3 were games that I did play quite a bit. In Breath of Fire 2, Nina had the ability to fly because the version of Nina in that game had the ability to fly. And... What that really meant for the player when controlling Nina on the field map was if she fell into a hole, because she could fly, she could just sort of soar back out of the hole and not uh, fall victim to the trap. I kind of figured maybe this Nina was capable of that too, but she's not. She just sort of fell into the hole. Just wanted to point that out. Breath of Fire 3 Nina, of course, wasn't capable of, even though she had a pair of wings on her back, she was sort of like, she couldn't fly. She was like a flightless windy in her or whatever. All, the, all of them in that game were incapable of flight as far as I could tell. In this one, this Nina is capable of limited flight. She can go up and down. And then, um, of course, Breath of Fire 1 and 2, Nina, the versions of Nina in that game were just sort of capable of flying all the time. So it's sort of like this weird up and down as far as what kind of abilities these characters actually had. I'll note that the character Nina in this is sort of like a bit of a hybrid character. Now in the first Breath of Fire, Nina was definitely a white mage style character. All of her abilities were based on the idea of healing and all that kind of stuff your own party members. Breath of Fire 2 made a pretty big change to that where... The Nina was more of a black mage character. All of her spells 
were based around offensive abilities, and she was a much more useful, as far as I'm concerned, anybody, character in that game. But in both cases, the both uh, one and two Nina were physically weak. Breath of Fire three comes along, and it sort of follows with the tradition of Breath of Fire two. Nina is a black mage. All of her abilities are based around the. Um, casting of offensive magic and she's also likewise physically weak in breath of fire 3 can't take a hit can't deliver a hit physically but can do some attacks magically now that doesn't work out so much in breath of fire 2 she's less of a useful character in breath of fire 2 because her magic abilities weren't quite as useful against, especially against bosses. They just tended not to hit all that hard. Plus, I mean, she was so weak that she would go down barely any hits. This game sort of redeems the concept of Nina a little bit and turns her into a little bit of a hybrid character. She has the ability to cast offensive magic, limited offensive magic, but she seems to primarily be a... Um, white mage, a healing character. But surprisingly enough, she also has some sort of, like, buffing abilities, like she can cast Protect on characters. Now, this is still fairly early in the game, so what other abilities she's going to end up developing later on, I don't know yet. But so far, she's got sort of like the whole gambit as far as magical abilities. But surprisingly enough, she actually possesses a not entirely unreasonably weak physical attack ability. Now, she's definitely the weakest physical attacker in the group that we have right now. And I take an... Oh, it's a new enemy. So we're gonna... I'll show it here. She'll, uh, okay, 153 points of damage compared to 241 that Ryu's capable of doing. Significantly less, sure. But... Enough that it makes sense that you're going to use Nina's physical attacks if you can't spare the AP. And AP is a bit of a thing that... It, oh, look, I got a moon sword. I didn't even realize it. AP is something that I tend to run out of in this game fairly often. So relying on her physical attacks when all else fails is useful. I would say that she's kind of like a Riku-like character in a certain way. Riku's a character from Final Fantasy X, where she doesn't quite fit into the mold of a magic character or a physical attack character, and she can deal physical damage, and she's certainly physically stronger than all of the casting characters. But she's not really one where you're just going to stand there and throw physical attacks with her all of the time. See, look, she has Barrier, Rejuvenate, Purify, Heal, and Sever, which is a, an attack power. But uh, Nina in this game, the fourth Nina, just like Riku in Final Fantasy X, can, in a pinch, throw physical attacks and have it not be a complete waste of time. So it's, it's just a something that I came to the conclusion of in this game. Boss battle time. What is this weird... It's like a bipedal elephant? Bipedal woolly mammoth? I don't know what the hell this is supposed to be. 
Okay, I'm recording this, like I said before, I'm recording this commentary post-gameplay. So I do happen to know that I will win this fight. <laughs> but it's something I had to point out, I pointed out while playing it that didn't get recorded, that I am pretty much playing through this game blind. I've never played a substantial amount of Breath of Fire 4 before. In fact, this is further along than I had ever reached before. So, unlike a playthrough of Breath of Fire 3 I did a few years back, or a potential playthrough of Breath of Fire 2, or whatever, I don't have any sort of foreknowledge of the weaknesses of enemies, uh, how difficult bosses are, or all that kind of stuff. So, I don't have... Like, I'm, I'm gonna stumble around a little bit. And I stumbled around while wandering through the forest maze, and I may not do things the most efficiently. Now the example that I'm that we're gonna see here, and I pointed out before, is the combo system. I, as of recording this, don't understand the combo system. There's I know it has something to do with chaining together magical attacks. Your first character that attacks throws a magic attack. Then your second character that attacks casts a magic attack and that supports the original attack. But how to make it work, I don't know. There's also things like, until this battle, I didn't swap characters out from the back row into the main party. Like, Nina's unconscious right now. Urshan is swapped into the party here. You know, swap Nina back out, you can do all that kind of stuff. It's something that I didn't really take part of. I kind of ignored until this part of the game. Oh, by the way, Nina took one hit and went down, so I guess she is a bit fragile in this game as well. So there's a lot of the nuance that I do not yet understand, and I know that there were tutorials and stuff that I've run across so far that would have explained this stuff, but I kind of skipped over it like an idiot. So I'm definitely, before I make the next episode, do the necessary research and figuring out how to take advantage of that kind of stuff figure somebody in the comments would probably go and say what you need to do is go and uh, do this attack with this character and this, attack with this character and it would chain together and that increases your attack power by X percentage or whatever. I'll figure it out. I do note that things didn't qu mm -hmm. I thought maybe I understood how to make them work in this battle with the chain combo thing. I thought you would just throw this magic attack with the first character, then the second character you throw a magic attack and it works like that. Turns out it doesn't work that way because, well, I'll go and like Flame Strike, which chained previously, then Rock Blast, which I think chained previously. Urshan can't use magic, so I brought Nina in here. Cast Sever, which chained previously, and what do you know? It doesn't chain. That didn't chain there. Hmm. But Rock Blast will. Okay, it's a combo. It's called combo, not chain. Okay, one hit. Damage, 160. Sever. 202. Two hits. Then it disappears. So, why didn't Ryu's attack work? It did before. It didn't this time, and I don't know why. But then again, I'll figure it out. <laughs> don't, don't bother telling me. <laughs> See, there we go. I used a different magic attack, thinking maybe the flame strike just wouldn't work. Now, Rock Blast comes across. That worked the last turn. Didn't work this turn. Hmm. Two thirty-seven. She has a powerful mage in this. Breath of Fire 3, she had more magic attacks than anybody else, but she wasn't really a powerful mage. I guess that game didn't really have a powerful offensive mage. Her attacks just didn't seem to work all that well. Oh, something happens here I didn't realize, and I wonder if he does it for every character. But, uh... He took that hit for Nina. He even asked if she's okay. Even though he's the one that got the shit knocked out of him. <laughs> anyway, this this fight's almost over. 
Kato. I was, of course, unsure how much damage I had to do on this thing. I was pretty confident that I was going to win this fight, because we're early enough in the game where boss battles tend to be fairly simple in these kinds of things. But I wasn't sure. Turns out, like, this is, this is pretty much the end. There you go, it's dead. 